How do you get these performances? And I think that my first job is to be a really good writer to the to the actors. Um, you know, I, n to not describe it in in the script. So much, so many times, you see so much description of what the character is supposed to be feeling and stuff in, in screenplays, and it's just a big mistake. It has to be done through dialogue and 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 what they do. It's a miracle any time any one of them gets made. You know, it's a miracle, and it's a miracle every time. I feel like it's a miracle every time a scene kind of gets done and through the birth canal and done. I mean, it's never any less of a miracle or, or any less difficult. I, I enrolled in NYU and I went there for literally two days. What, what happened was I walked into this class and the, the, this teacher said, "You know, if anyone is here to write Terminator 2, just walk out, just get out of the door." And I thought, well, that's just not a good way to start. What if I do want to write Terminator 2? What if someone sitting next to me wants to write? You know, he was sort of instantly saying, you know, we write serious films here, you know. Terminator 2 is a pretty awesome movie. There just should be no fear, you know. I think that's... I just always remember kind of being pummeled by fear early on and feeling like, God, if I could have just got rid of that fear earlier, I, this, this might have been a little bit easier. It's just... Don't give a fuck. That's kind of the best thing to do. You know, families are just endless, juicy ammunition for great stories, you know. They're never going to let you down for, for good drama or, or, or good comedy. <laughs> Normally, I assume you're off riding by yourself, but this one was a little bit different, I think. You had some collaboration. Normally, I'm by myself or... When I get lonely, I kind of turn to Joanne, my producer, and share things with her, or even Dylan, the editor, but mostly by myself. But this time, um, I turned to Daniel early on, and I knew him well enough, and we've kept in touch over the years, and I knew like it would be foolish to just take like a year and write by myself when I'm writing something for him. I have to sort of take him, and we have to sort of sit in the same room together and really work together. And he should, probably should have some kind of co-writing you know, credit, but he, you don't know. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so w was the germ of it always this, we're going to make a love story, we're going to make a story of this man and this woman, and that's, that's how you began? Yeah, like you imagine a notebook, right? Man and a woman, romantic, sister, question mark, gothic romance, all those little things that you just kind of keep noting to yourself. And then going back and watching Rebecca again, and then watching Vertigo again, and watching all those things again, and looking for clues, and reading Daphne du Maunier, and kind of filling up on stuff that was in this venue, you know, Caroline Blackwood, like finding, oh, you know, Amazon likes or recommend this, if you like, oh, well, that's, that's good, you know, and just more and more and more of that. And, um, the story was a, f a little bit more fully formed than I'm, I'm, I'm making it out to be. There was the idea that there was a very strong-willed man and a woman who enters his life and what happens when they discover that when he's weak, he's at his best in terms of the relationship and how that affects their future. So the exciting part became the research because neither one of us really knew much of anything about couture or fashion in the 50s, so that became... You seem so couture right now. <laughs> you seem like this is a natural element for you. I'll have you know that this sweater is cashmere. <laughs> Could you offer any advice to someone who is young, bright-eyed, and, and earnestly trying to get right in there? Mm. The one thing I was I remember thinking initially when I was trying to make films and... You always felt like you got nervous that somebody else was right who was talking to you, you know, who maybe was in a position of power, like that their opinion somehow was was right or better than yours and somehow. And you, you didn't, could never stop to think like, no, it's just different. You just think differently than I do and that's okay, you know, but I'm not wrong. You know, you can get filled with such fear and it's really easy to get, to just get your heart broken and kind of sort of beaten. Uh, you're sort of attempting to make films. I mean, you just, it's a miracle any time any one of them gets made, you know? It's a miracle, and it's a miracle every time I feel like, it's a miracle every time a scene kind of gets done and through the birth canal and done. I mean, it's never any less of a miracle or, or any less difficult. Um, it's just a kind of, there just should be no fear, you know? I think that's, just always remember kind of being pummeled by fear early on and feeling like, God, if I could have just got rid of that fear earlier, I, this, this might have been a little bit easier. It's just don't give a fuck. That's kind of the best thing to do. Now, you didn't go to film school. Right. Why? 
Um, I think a, 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 a weird combination of things. I think that there was, a, I, I, it was my plan in high school that I wouldn't go to film school, but then you know, a couple years out of high school, when I wasn't instantly directing a movie, I started to kind of panic and, and thought about going to film school and even did go to NYU, enrolled in NYU. At first what happened was I couldn't get in anywhere. So when I couldn't get in, because my, my grades in high school weren't very good, so I couldn't get into college. And so what it did was create this attitude in me like, I don't need film school. Anyway, because you've got to find some way to justify why you didn't, you know, and make it feel good to yourself. You can't get into college, you know, so you just start saying, well, that's bullshit, you know, anyway. <laughs> but then I started getting really nervous. I needed something, and I needed help. And I, 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 I enrolled in NYU, and I went there for literally two days. What, what happened was, I walked into this class and the, the, this teacher said, you know, if anyone is here to write Terminator 2, just walk out, just get out of the door. And I thought, well, that's just not a good way to start. What if I do want to write Terminator 2? What if someone sitting next to me wants to write? You know, he was sort of instantly saying, you know, we write serious films here, you know. Terminator 2 is a pretty awesome movie. <laughs> um, so he said, yeah, so there was an assignment to hand, there was an assignment to write. It was you write a page um, that, 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 that it has no dialogue in it, right? But you got to make sure that uh, you, you explain something about a character. You show a character trait through action with no dialogue, right? And I had read this, this, this uh, great script by David Mamet, which was Hoffa, which was not made at the time. And there was a great scene that Mamet had written, where Danny DeVito is driving along, his character's driving along, and it shows what he's going through by the method he uses to keep himself awake while driving, which is he lights a cigarette and he holds it between his hands and he lets it burn down to his fingers to keep him burning, him, burning his fingers and keeping him awake. That's just so simple and perfect and lovely, and it's, you know, Mr. Pulitzer Prize himself, David Mamet. So I took that page and I handed it in. And, uh, <laughs> and it got a C plus. <laughs> and I said, all right, now I know I'm right. And there's a wonderful thing that if you drop out quick enough, you can get your tuition back. <laughs> if, if I've ever had a theme in mind, I mean, usually that's just like the worst. You're mm -hmm. kind of, then you're, yeah. then you know, you feel yourself, you feel yourself writing. And there's nothing worse than that feeling of kind of chasing after a theme. I mean, that's always like writing and it's worse for me, you know. Um, the best things kind of become something and you're just happy it's there it's just um the better way to go in terms of getting better writing is having two characters that are more opposite you know that way you yeah. get more traction and stuff but um ultimately if you ha if things are going well and the characters are coming out of you or you know they're going to guide you how they're going to go and yeah. you, you, i remember at a certain point reading um, a great short story called, I believe it's called Bucket of Blood, John O'Hara wrote a oh. great story about a fella, it starts out, he's just, he wakes up in a, a hospital and he's, uh, he comes to and he's having this great conversation with a doctor, he's just had his appendix removed because his appendix is burst on this uh, train and he doesn't know, he wakes up, he doesn't know where he was. And there's just this great conversation at the beginning of it between a doctor and um, this patient, this guy. Mm. Right? And uh, I started um, to transcribe. I just wrote it down in, in a script form thinking, oh, maybe I'll, this would be an adaption or something. Or as I've done before, too, you sort of steal something. If you, you, you got, you're bored and you've got nothing to do, you know, yeah. there's no better exercise than just write somebody else's words down to see how they look typed out yeah. just to get you inspired again or to get it moving and that's what I was doing with the John O'Hara thing and by the look of it and the sound of it it seemed to fit with some of these other things that I had had lying around so this that character started to come more and more and you just start finding pieces of them and um, you hope that they start to, to talk to you um, yeah. talk back at you in a kind of in a weird kind of, it sounds hocus pocus, but it's like a weird kind of seance. You hope that you are not there at a certain point, that yeah. they're just doing the work for you. That's when it's at its best. I've, I've said this before, but I did. I set out to write something really small and cheap after Boogie Nights. I wanted to just make a movie. Small and cheap? Yeah. yeah. I just figured the best thing to do here with all this sort of Boogie Nights stuff that was happening and yeah. sort of attention paid to me, it was really nice, but I thought I, got, I, wanted, I should do my job, you know, and my job is to just make movies. So I sat down and I started to write. And there was so much happening uh, in my life at the time, and I was just going through so much. Um, 
uh, sort of personal things, you know, that, that I just kept writing. I kept writing what was going on around me, what, whether, it was, whether it was me or people that I knew. Um, you know, I sort of just ended up sort of vomiting out onto the page all the stuff that was around me. So that's what it's about. It, you know, that's what it's about. It's, it's about me. What part of this movie is about you? all of it and that's not being really all of it i mean um you know um we all have families yeah. <laughs> that we uh, you know have to figure out and deal with and try and um, explore w w what went wrong <laughs> or that, what's going is on is that what interests you the most a sort of sense of the angst or the, the the dysfunctionality of a life sure yeah yeah because that's where the interesting stuff is. It's yeah. It's you know. I think that uh, you know, families are just endless, juicy ammunition for great stories. You know, they're never going to let you down for for good drama or, or or good comedy. Did you like that though? That precision in the cutting in that sequence, that question and answer sequence, because that felt so new to me for you. And there's a kind of a something I don't often think of in your films, a real kind of narrative momentum in the, in that particular scene. Well, let them tell the truth. I don't want to. I'm not going to. You know, I'm not going to tell the truth by, or, or make my own truth by kind of cutting it up a bunch of different ways. And that's just luck of the draw to get a scene that, that can work like that, can actually work as a suspense scene and, 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 and work as this dynamic interplay. But at the same time, you're learning something about um, this person, this character. So these kinds of ideas of screenwriting, only you know, plot and momentum and character and, and you know, usually the worst scenes that you have to go do in a movie are the ones that will, will move the story forward. You know, you've got to stop for a second and somebody has to kind of say some really horrible dialogue about, you know, well, the reactor, you know, is, will blow up if we don't have, you know, whatever it is. Writing can happen pretty fast sometimes if it's going well and then a lot of, and then it's just an excuse like you can say, I'm going to write now, you know, when really you're going down and locking the door to your room to research, to just, con to, to read, to steal time, to kind of fill up the, um, the tank on a period, you know, um, or something particular, um, you know, this film has very particular things that it's based on, so getting to know that as best as I could is time well spent, probably time better spent than than actually typing um, because that actual writing can happen very very fast if you feel comfortable that you're kind of connected with that period and that time and those people I try to avoid that moment of like sitting down and looking at a blank piece of paper ever you know that kind of that you have to put chips in something um, so you never get to that spot and what I mean is the energy after I've finished shooting a film has led me um, you have this false kind of energy. I've, I've, I've had it a few times now where you don't collapse at the end of it. You actually feel like I could do this again. And, and, and it, what it is is you're stepping back into normal life, but you're still sort of firing on all these cylinders. Right. And a couple times now I've gotten up, gone to, gone to the coffee maker, sat down and really started to write what I felt I would want to make next, even as vague and bizarre or unclear as it was. It was a story of a man and a woman, a relationship, a this, a that, a this. Somehow the dialogue starts coming. Okay, now, days later, you are, you, the, the energy that you've been spending making a film and the physical reality of what you've been through, you just sort of collapse. Yeah. But it's really, it's happened to me a couple times now where I've gotten a lot of kind it's of... residual energy. Absolutely. So there's like foothold into something that was obviously nagging at me or all this and it happened on this one i think after inherent vice um i started to sort of write a bunch of things down straight away that it had occurred to me and that during the course of editing that film i was daydreaming about what this movie would be and trying to write things down but not trying to write too much and i think it was Back to this thing that we talked about before, it was wanting to not get to a mess that I have been in before, which is writing 600 pages yeah. and having to bring it down. So I had enough ideas on this where I felt like daydream and daydream and think about it and turn it over in your mind and write a little bit here and there, but never get to that spot where you've overwritten it or you're, you haven't figured a few things out before you really jump in. It's funny because someone's saying, you know, 
uh, did, how do you get these performances? And I think that my first job is to be a really good writer to the to the actors. Um, you know, I, n to not describe it in in the script. So much, so many times, you see so much description of what the character is supposed to be feeling and stuff in, in screenplays, and it's just a big mistake. It has to be done through dialogue and 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 what they do. W what are they going to? Are they going to walk across the street? You know, then that is a, that that's. A character trait, you know, they're making that decision, and so the, the, the scripts that I write for them are very clean. They're sort of very clean of a lot of sort of flowery explanation of what they're supposed to be feeling. I think the actors really appreciate that. It it lets them do their job and enables them to just act. You know what I mean? The distance between making that when I was 17, which was this little script that I wrote out, it's like probably you know 14 or 15 pages, and writing the script for that was Boogie Nights, I, I was constantly writing for nine years. I wrote, like, a full version that was a fictional documentary, like, you know, like Zelig. It was, like, 80 pages or something that expanded it out. And then I wrote another draft, you know, that was the same thing. But then I decided, well, no, I should try to turn this into a film, you know. And I tried, and I wrote it as uh, very probably kind of close to what Boogie Nights is now. It was, in other words... An exercise to learn how to write. It was almost like, um, like a I wrote first novel. Like, yeah. well, I suppose a first novel was more like, um, like I wrote some story that that I thought was true, that really had happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, that was like a documentary, yeah. and then set about adapting it. But when I look back on it now, you talk about how did you practice? Or I felt like I guess I just practiced for about eight years writing that one story, trying to learn how to write, learn how to feel good about putting words together and scenes together and getting it to getting it, shaping it so that it felt good, that I was confident and I wasn't embarrassed by looking at it on the page. I mean, that was really, isn't that so much of what writing is, is that you're not yeah. humiliated at looking at it. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs>